thank you so much for joining us here today. It's a real great pleasure to have you here and you will be participating in the closing performance of the 50th anniversary of the World Economic Forum. How does that make you feel? It's uh, an incredible opportunity. Um, when we started discussing with the forum about composing a piece, uh, obviously it represents uh, a huge opportunity. Um, so much discussion happens here. So many voices are being used to tackle very difficult ideas. Um, and a really consistent theme in all of my work is the biggest problem we face is silence. The idea that people are not inspired to speak up and share and express. Um, so this composition I've done in collaboration with uh, Rama Allen and The Mill in New York and created some incredible visuals uh, and the London Contemporary Voices Choir is there to represent when you find a new idea, when you process it and then to eventually express it. So these three movements I think represent a very important uh, subject that's at the very heart of Davos and I'm here to push that message. celebrating the 50th year. It started off with 444 business leaders uh, all in 1971, yet that transition to the arts has come about. Why do you think that is? It's such an important question. Why do artists matter at Davos? And I think on the global stage, more and more artists are being relied upon when it comes to finding new ways to communicate. Um, it's such a frustrating thing when you realise that all of these beautiful tools of reason and uh, intelligent ways of uh, sharing expertise, it's simply not enough. Uh, the people out there, uh, the masses, the real numbers um, that exist on planet Earth are not being accessed. And it's the role of art to make sure that these incredible ideas, these wonderful discoveries and uh, the new philosophies and approaches to this next decade uh, are being shared in brand new ways. And artists, I think, we are the, the governors of narrative. It's our job to make sure that the stories are being told. Doesn't that feel like a huge responsibility? Of course, but that's uh, why we're here at Davos, is to take on huge responsibility and to make sure that the unrepresented are being represented. And when you think of uh, misinformation, when you think of uh, the fact of fake news, uh, you associate that almost with storytelling and sort of uh, simulation and non-truth. Um, but counterintuitively, the only way to undo misinformation, to represent what is really happening in the world, is to use sensation. You have to use experience. How do you describe what you do? So all of my work centers around two main pillars. Um, the first is to tackle uh, new technologies. Um, voice and technology is a really exciting space. And in the same way that the voice very much mirrors the human condition, what you can do with your voice mirrors all of the relationships that you build and uh, are active in your day daily life. So when you start to question, okay, how can we use the voice with new technology? Um, you can raise some very interesting questions and contribute to research. So I stand on the shoulders of academics, work with uh, visual artists, sound artists as a director to try and use art to communicate these uh, future concepts, um, which are actually now in the present. The second pillar is all about the human voice. So what is the full potential of the human voice? Um, on an expressive level outside of language. So when you speak, there's tone and pitch and range, and there's all these psychoacoustic qualities that people take in and absorb, and this builds your character. You'd be very aware of this. So there are many fundamentals expressively in the voice which are not being utilized. So my job is to explore technology, explore art, but then also push the human voice as far as it can go to make people think, are we connecting? Are we communicating? Are we using our voices the way we could? Harry, when did you realise at what age that you wanted to use your voice and start vocalising and that you had this talent? Well, the main thing is it's very different challenges what I do, what I want to do. Uh, my, for example, my music and my composition to talking about what the world should do. Um, but the sentiment, there is a connection because when I was young, 
um, not feeling like I had a traditional ways of communicating and sharing and accessing like the, the world outside of London. I felt very trapped in, in London. Um, by composing and writing music using the voice, there's an instancy. You do not have to rely on anyone. It's something that you can compose and control. And it started to be just a writing tool. I never thought that that journey of pushing it and pushing it and pushing it, understanding and exploring, uh, would eventually mean that I start to do things with the voice which have not happened before. And the subculture that I was a part of were doing things that voice academics had never seen. And that's strange because the voice is as old as we are. The voice should be covered. So when I found that I can contribute, and um, there's this, this island of self which is not totally understood, uh, or pushed to its limit, I felt an insane sense of purpose. So as, again, a young kid growing up in London, to feel that sense of purpose, that sense of contribution, um, I started to express more, to explore more. And that expansion just hasn't stopped. And, uh, and now we're here at Davos. <laughs> Could you ever have imagined that you would be closing Davos 2020? Well, this is the great thing. I feel like it is a time of change and there are preconceptions, there are tropes. But me being here totally represents that as an artist who, of course, I work with incredible people. I've worked with amazing institutions. Um, but through the intention to try and contribute and go beyond just your subjective concept of art could actually lead to a world stage. And it can lead to a place where there are conversations and ideas happening that have some kind of objective impact, quantifiable impact. And um, that's at the very heart of, of uh, my intention. So as a 14-year-old kid, maybe not. But with the last few years of work, I think it's, uh, it's such a great sentiment that Davos and WEF is open to artists being experimental, uh, playing, and trying to represent some of the philosophies that are developed and pushed here. You mentioned as a 14-year-old kid, it was very different. So what, what were you thinking about then? Um, so at the time, I was mostly focused on uh, supporting my family, looking after my family. Um, and I think, like many young people across the world, is that sense of purpose. What is my purpose? Why am I here? What, is, what parts of the world do I have access to? And uh, the most important idea there is in discovering art, discovering uh, music, I was able to develop a dream. Like I, as a young person, I could have something that I would aspire to push and grow. And the biggest epidemic we have right now is young people are potentially losing their capacity to dream yes. because they feel like they do not have uh, the opportunity to be listened to. And with all of the narratives in terms of sustainability, and we all know the conversations about Earth and what is happening and potentially happening, young people feel like their dreams are not so simple to aspire towards. So my job is to remind people, remind young people that they need to have a dream because in doing that, you can create an anchor, a focus, a trajectory, and we can't lose that aspiring energy. And how do you give a voice to those that don't have one? There are many examples of vocal experimentation uh, contributing to speech therapy. For example, I visited an incredible program in New York uh, at the Lavelle School for the Blind. And at Lavelle School for the Blind, they were teaching vocal experimentation. Many of the kids there struggle to speak, and there is a lack of clarity and articulation. And for the first time, in exploring sound making, uh, in exploring how they can control their voice using a musical system, stammers were disappearing articulation was improving, and we were literally giving voices to the voiceless. You could see that through this type of play. And now that's having uh, an impact on speech therapy on a much wider scale. And that's talking from a technical perspective. People also ignore their voices. If you think about how it feels, how it resonates, the tone, the fact that it affects every single relationship you have with your loved ones, your working relationships, it also affects your sense of self. 
So to speak out, to share, has a direct correlation with what you're internally processing. So encouraging people to experiment in this way, to go beyond their comfort zone, to push it that little bit further, uh, encourages sense of self, it encourages communication, um, and it's completely free. Uh, so there's a very interesting statistic where uh, with expertise, um, the human voice and language is actually the most common form of expert behavior found on planet Earth. If you look at all forms of expertise, so this flow, uh, this expression, we are designed to be masterful with our voices. So we must encourage people to think about this. Harry, talking about being masterful with voices, are there any new techniques? I I'd love you to, I think there's a microphone mm. you have just to show us. So it's a very strange idea to consider what is happening uh, in the world of voice, because how can something so profoundly old still innovate? And you have uh, some very established extended techniques, things like throat singing. Which I think a lot of people may have heard before, um, but there's newer innovations. So for example, in the 60s, you had something called multiphonics, where when uh, the jazz uh, sort of movement was at its height, so much experimentation, uh, when you play a brass instrument that you make a buzz on your lips. But these musicians, they started to sing through that buzz. And what you get is the ability to harmonize. So that as a technique is, that's not speech, that's not phonetics, that's something else. But the uh, articulatory control um, is something brand new. But now in the last five years, you have an explosion of machine-like motor function control. Um, there's some very interesting techniques. Uh, specifically, there's one technique called the inward drag, um, where I currently have one of the fastest recorded uses of the human diaphragm. Which again, why does that matter? What is that? But again, the body is something that should be covered, and the diaphragm is such a fundamental. So this technique uh, shows the precision and some of the new types of control that can come from contemporary vocal techniques. And it sounds a little bit like this. Regardless of the musical merit of something like that, um, it is this fundamental idea that we can control our body in new ways. And musically, I go to the upper extreme, but that is not relevant to everyone. The thing that is relevant is that there are new ideas in the voice, and we need to wake up to the absolute fundamental role it has in our daily lives and to use it as a medium to explore technology, to explore new narratives, and to explore instilling a sense of self in people. That spectrum is what I represent. Harry, how do you think the human voice has evolved over the years? Previously, we were not able to have such dexterity in our voices. Um, and over the last 20,000 years, there has been uh, extensions to the tongue and to allow for certain forms of um, experimentation and articulation. Um, but the main idea is uh, socially, the evolutions that you find are not physical. It's in terms of uh, the relationship between the spoken word, the use of the voice, and civilization is, of course, such a strong uh, connection. And if you think in terms of a display, the way in which we represent our identities, we've all heard someone sing and we found them extremely beautiful. Uh, and we all have our loved ones and the people we care about, the tone, the pitch, the resonance of their voice can be such a home creating feeling. 
So these evolutions in technique represent a type of musical expression, but some of these, uh, you could call them uh, evolutions of concept, are just about revealing something that is already there. And the fact that we can reveal and push the expertise of the voice to its absolute limit. But what is that limit? How do you push it? So on average, languages have about 30 phonemes. So sounds used to produce language that are responsible for affecting speech. Um, but based off that statistic, and you compare that to uh, articulatory phonetics and all of the sounds that are now known to be possible with the voice, again, that's, uh, we're only using about 20% of our vocal range. So it's a very simple idea. It's not about pushing it to the absolute extreme, but it's thinking about how can you, in your daily life, increase that 20%. When you wake up in the morning, listen to your voice. When you are speaking to someone, feel it, and develop a mindful approach to the way you are speaking to the people around you. Because the amount of ways in which that can affect your sense of self and your well-being and your relationships uh, is absolutely undeniable. And I want to represent the fact that there will soon be eight billion voices on planet Earth. Um, and those are eight billion untapped voices. So can I use artwork, the people around me use expression to try and utilize the potential of the voice and increase that 20% globally. Because if we can, you can increase the well-being of the planet globally. We can connect to each other and ourselves more intensely. And I think that is an important manifestation of art. What about the role of technology and the importance of it in this? In a lot of my work, we do something called voice-centered experience design. So it's trying to create experiences, whether it's composition, VR, AR, using machine learning, uh, exhibitions, installations, to use uh, the voice as a gateway into other ideas. As we all know, we're moving into the age of assistance. We're actually speaking more and more to uh, digital humans. And when you think about that interacting with digital humanism, many of the general public will associate that with science fiction. And the truth is that technology is here, it is now. The fact that we're gonna to have to learn to adapt and find this type of technology accessible is a very important subject. So one of the projects I did last year was in collaborations with Bell Labs and an incredible collective called Dada Bots where we took an hour of me speaking, we took an hour of me performing, and we used that as a data set uh, to train a recurrent neural network to start to produce and speak and perform like me. Um, I do not believe there is any true AI. Uh, the, the concept of artificial intelligence is so ambiguous, but what there is is augmented intelligence. So in this project, I augmented with this opponent. When I was growing up, I was uh, a tournament chess player. And uh, my first interaction with artificial intelligence was through chess. Now with machine learning, we can create opponents, mentors, collaborators with anything. So incorporating technology uh, into this conversation, using machine learning to produce a second self, to connect, to perform, and push myself further, that mirrors how we should all be approaching AI. This concept that it's not about automation, it's about augmentation. And me pushing the most human thing on Earth to be recomposed, uh, regenerated using machine learning process uh, shows us that machine learning can be used for anything to inspire and test. And we want the general public to engage with concepts like machine learning, and that's what the art we make uh, does. Harry, I know we have a clip from the work that you're talking about, so let's just have a look at that now. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. And I 
Lord for a piece of rosin. Let's listen. And for with VDM, and this is really just. Tell us, Harry, about what we were seeing and hearing. So that's a very small clip. Um, it's the beginning of a conversation between myself and a digital twin. Uh, you see me speak, and then there is a generative voice that speaks back. Then I perform, then there's a cluster of sounds and compositions, phrases that I'd never done before uh, comes back towards me. And then eventually you see I sing and then it sings back and there's a, a composition that is triggered at that point. So it was using machine learning as a writing tool uh, to show the, a literal conversation between myself and machine learning process, uh, but also how we can actually integrate. And I practically use this tech to push myself further. There are phrases and combinations of the sounds and percussion that I had never done. And the AI uh, process was generating brand new compositions that I could work with. And I just think that's such an exciting idea, is you can take your specialism, take what you are good at, and you can use machine learning to create a brand new perspective. You're able to feed, and in doing that, you get a response which is you, but not you. It's not an AI, it's not an autonomous thing. It's something new. And in art, as an artist, touches on maybe the intention for what I want to achieve from when I was younger, is you want to work with things that have never happened before. And composition, painting, uh, dance, movement, all these things are vastly versed and explored, but computing and art is a brand new space. So I was intent in showing that individuals can use these technologies. I'm not a huge uh, umbrella tech academic institution. I'm an individual and I've been able to find the best people in the world to create an exploration that is based off the individual. And I will say that is the most important thing, is that there's a lot of top-down accessibility of technology and new ideas, but we also need to have bottom-up, individuals taking ownership and using these technologies so that they do not rely on the sensation of storytelling and press they can actually experience it for themselves. And there's a lot of work to do to inspire people to do that. Harry, you're inspiring people, but also everyday technology voices. And I'm thinking of Alexa, Siri, and all those mm. voice activation. What do you think about that? I think the fact that we're able to learn things, to engage, um, to have our ideas spoken back to us, and this, this kind of inward process of talking to an assistant, I do think has massive benefits. And there's many conversations about using this technology to create conversations which otherwise do not exist. The elderly, the very young. And with any technology like this, there can be a knee-jerk reaction to that. Those are vulnerable people. Why would you give access to the vulnerable, um, a technology that's emerging, but used as a medium you can use this to create a connection, a conversation. It can be used to teach. And the most important aspect of this is the concept of personality design. What do we want voices to be? What do we want them to sound like? Why do we want that? How much control do we have over that, uh, that voice? And it begs the question, as a, as a collective, what is the future of voices and those assistants and the way that we use the voice as an interface uh, is going to become more and more of a question because the voice is synonymous with the human condition. Harry, how do you take care of your own voice? Sleep. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I, uh, I have to see a specialist just because um, in my performances, I take a lot of pride in, as I have said many times in this interview, trying to go to the upper extreme limits. Um, I've been described as a voice astronaut, which is not something I always use, but 
for some reason now it feels appropriate. Um, but in doing that, I have to be very respectful of my humanity. I'm not a machine. I'm able to speak like a machine. Um, but this uh, being self-aware, doing something new, you have to respect that. Um, and uh, like I said, the key thing is sleep and honey, ginger and lemon. <laughs> Oh, good. I'm glad that's a honey ginger lemon. That's very practical. Mm. Well, The Economist called you a champion for a new generation of young musicians. What does that type of recognition mean to you? The, the world is unfolding laterally. It's becoming, uh, it's always been complex, but there is actually a, uh, a, a desperate need for representing, um, shining torches on new problems with as many as possible. What are all of the uh, intelligent angles we can use to illuminate and explore these difficult problems? And as an artist, I'm here to represent where I'm from. I'm here to represent the people that I care about. I'm here to represent the arts and pushing that the arts can be practical. It can be quantifiable. You can have storytellers come in and be the empathy end of the process to make sure that they really connect and when they use the term champion, I prefer to see it as championing. I'm trying to fight for this practical application of the arts and trying to make the wider world, not just the artistic community, the entertainment community, realize that artists have a place and a contribution and we need to learn to harvest that, to teach articulation, uh, to teach focus, so that they can truly integrate and not just be a whistles and bells addition to a wonderful event. So that's a huge challenge, but it is happening. My work with United Nations, my work with Harvard, my work with Bell Labs has all represented this concept of including artists to create narratives, to rewrite narratives. Harry, where do you want to push it more? What's next for you? A lot of my work has started out with this subjective desire to be exceptional in my performances. But now it's really moving towards not a subjective mission, but something that I would consider a more objectively purposeful mission. And this phrase, eight billion untapped voices. This is the mission over the next 10 years. Can we actually not just explore technology, not just create wonderful artwork and exhibit, can we actually create a narrative that allows for people to be encouraged to push their voice? The voice of humanity is untapped. What is a global voice and can we tap into what will be 8 billion voices on planet Earth? Well, Harry, hopefully you will tap into the 8 billion voices. You've certainly tapped into all of us here. Thank you so much for joining us. Harry F., also known as Reach 100, thank you so much for being with us today. My, my pleasure. Cheers.